Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Shi'ur. Just going to have a look. Is Mrs. Weidegger here this morning? So I can wish her a Mazal Tov together with everybody and the extended family as well. Yes, yes, you're here under the name Baba. Mazal Tov, Mrs. Weidegger, on the engagement of your great granddaughter. I hope I got that right. And for all the other Mazal Tovs in the family, uh, Baruch Hashem, they should. Uh, Keep coming and you should continue having nachas from all your generations. And they should all get tremendous inspiration from you for many years to come as well. Mazal tov, mazal tov. So um, let's get going with the Kliyakar on Parashat Shlach Lecha. Um, here we go in source number one. Shlach Lecha is a really big parasha, a really big parasha. Um, so much of Jewish history has changed because of events connected to Parashat Shlach Lecha. And uh, therefore, every time we learn Parashat Shlach Lecha, we learn additional details. Wait a second, was that actually Mrs. Nostbaum I saw before? Sorry, Mrs. Werdegar I saw before. I'm not clear where. My screen isn't great. Michelle, is your mother here? She should be here. She should be there. Okay, so maybe she was in all right. Shoreham, right. but she said she was joining. Uh, joining from Shoreham, okay, maybe that's why it looks a bit different. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so let's go from the beginning of the parasha. Vaydaber Hashem el Moshe leimor. Hashem said to Moshe as follows: Shlach lecha anashim. Send for yourself men. Now this word lecha is going to be the key word, as it is for so many of the mafarshim. What does it mean when Hashem says to Moshe, Shlach lecha, send for yourself? And of course, this isn't just a linguistic question, but it's coming to the real core of the question here. Did Hashem want us to send Meraglim or not? So, Shlach Lecha Anashim. V'yaturu et Eretz Canaan, and they should scout out the land of Canaan, Asher and Yonotel of Israel that I'm giving to the Israelites. Ishechad, Ishechad, Lamatea, Botav, Tishlachu. One per tribe. Kol Nasi Vahem, they should all be Nasiim. And the Kliyaka will share some ideas here about this word, lecha, each one sharing some insight into this process, but also raising some questions about what's going on here. Shlach lecha anashim. Lefish amru Yisrael, you see the initiative is all ours, as we know from later on in the Torah, from the book of Dvarim. We said, nishlecha lefanenu anashim, v'yichbaru lanu et ha'aret, let us send men ahead of us, and they will scout out, find out about the land Lanu for us. So our request included the word Lanu. We said to Moshe, Moshe, please, we want to spy out the land Lanu for us. Lanu, what does that mean? Hainu, that means that it should be in our benefit and it should be to our good. Hashem says to Moshe, send for yourself but it's not going to be for them. Meaning, send in your own interest, but it's not going to be in, your, in their interest. You're going to do well out of this shlichut. How does Moshe do well out of the story of the Meraglim? It won't be their interest. Why? They all had to die out because of the shlichut. We know why. This story was a bad story for the Maraglim. Ula Moshe, how did Moshe gain from this? Garam shana. Moshe got 40 more years added to his life. Kikva nigzar al Moshe shelo yireta asoy lamalchei sheva omot. It had already been decreed that Moshe will not see that which is going to be done to the seven nations. It had already been decreed that Moshe will not lead us into the land. But now, because of the sin of the Maraglim, we had to hang around in the Midbar for 40 years, meaning Moshe got 40 years added to his life. The suggestion is that Moshe was going to pass away when he was 80 years old, and that's when we would have entered Israel from the fact, or just over 80, but from the fact that our stay in the wilderness was extended, Moshe got to live for 40 extra years. Now, this, this, adds numerous questions to understanding to that which is going on in the Torah. Number one, if I was to stop you in the street from a distance and I'd ask you why wasn't Moshe allowed to enter the land, you would tell me it's because he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock. It appears that long before that story took place, 
It was already decreed that Moshe would not bring us into the land. The other thing we have to uh, remember, we, we've seen this in previous years, where, where's this known? You know, in last week's parasha, we read about Eldad and Medad prophesying in the camp. According to the Midrash, what they prophesied was that Moshe would die and Yeshua would bring us into the land. So this was a known concept. But also what we need to consider, and I don't know if the Kliyakar is going to follow through on this theme in his commentary in the continuation of the Torah, what it also means is that from now on, the Bnei Israel know that as long as Moshe is alive, they're stuck in the wilderness. Because they know that he needs to die in order for them to enter the land of Israel. So his very existence is a source of frustration and pain for the Israelites. And we'll see if the Kliakar is going to pick up on that later on the Torah or not. Either way, explanation number one, Shlach Lecha and Hashem, Moshe, you're going to do well out of this but it's going to be fairly disastrous for everybody else. Approach number two. Send men for yourself. Hashem says to Moshe, I want you to have a very good look with your Ruach HaKodesh. If these are the appropriate people for this mission. Most people are fooled by people who flatter, who fawn. Who show off about how kosher they are, but really they aren't. al therefore says to Moshe, Hashem says to him, Choose people who, in your opinion, are the right people for the job using Ruach HaKodesh. Those who, in your opinion, are important individuals. Not, don't follow what other people say. Could possibly what you see is not what you're getting. Their external appearance does not reflect their internal reality. Now, what's going on in this explanation? Uh, what the Kriyagar is saying is that Hashem says to Moshe, choose people using Ruach HaKodesh who you know are really decent people, which leads to the obvious question, where did it go wrong? If Moshe was using Ruach HaKodesh and he really knew who would be the right people for the job, how did it end up so disastrously wrong? Was there something wrong with his Ruach HaKodesh? So, so perhaps an answer to this, maybe this is why there's more than one answer, because none of the answers are perfect, but perhaps an answer to this can be a found, found in approach number three. Davar Acher, another explanation, Lecha Anashim, people for you. Hashem was saying to Moshe, you think that they're important in the people. Because you're a human with human eyes. So even with Ruach HaKodesh, a human is still a human. Sorry. All you can see is that which is currently available to see. You can only look at the individual based on where they are now. Because indeed, at that time, they were good people. So Moshe, let's say even with Ruach HaKodesh, looked at these individuals and he saw, this is a genuinely good person. Internally and externally, this is the real deal. He's going to be one of the Maraglim. Yet Moshe's vision was limited to that which was available to know in the present. Hashem says, in my eyes, Enam. Anashim Ksherim, they're not appropriate. Kianiro Eshteriot Hashem says, I've got a double vision. I know what's happening now, and I also know what's going to happen in the future. Kiatidin liot they're going to end up getting, getting things wrong. So, what Hashem is telling Moshe is, Shlach Lecha Anashim, you think they're Anashim, but really, I know that this is going to go wrong. And maybe this is an understanding in the words which Moshe wasn't familiar with at the time, and only later on he understood what Hashem was truly telling him. Because we need to ask, if Hashem is telling Moshe, you think these are good guys, but they're not actually good guys, then obviously what Moshe should do is choose other people. So I think that the fact that Shlach Lecha and Hashem could be understood in so many ways may be means that Moshe understood it in some ways, but not always. And only later on he understood the full meaning of Hashem's words, Either way, approach number three is, you think these are great people, but actually, in the long run, um, things are going to change. And he's now going to connect this to the timing. The Chazal Amru, our sages said, Again, we have this concept of smichut, juxtaposition. 
the order of the passages, especially in the book of Bamidbar, attracts much attention from our Mepharshim. So, last week's parasha finishes off with the story of Miriam when she spoke inappropriately about her brother. She wasn't the only one who spoke about her brother, but she's the only one who got punished. Anyway, why is the story of Miriam immediately followed by Shlach Lecha? Miriam Miriam was punished for speaking Lashon Hara. And therefore, in the newspapers, what was everybody talking about? Lashon Hara. What were the big campaigns about? Lashon Hara. What was it trendy to be worried about? Lashon Hara at the time. Rishaim halalu. These wicked people, Ra'u, they saw all of that context. And they still didn't learn the message from Miriam. Baratzalomar, and therefore it's telling us. Shemiyadachar ma'ase Miriam nishtachlu amraglim. So why were the Maraglim sent at this exact point in time, straight after the episode with Miriam? Ki amar Hashem, Hashem said, I want to give them the best possible chance to get things right. Pen yinachem, maybe they'll change their minds. Kol echad mehem, each of them. V'yikach musa birotom mashikara le Miriam. When they'll see what happened to Miriam for speaking inappropriately, maybe then they will learn that they have to speak appropriately about the land. And so the timing was deliberate. Because we've come immediately after the sin of Miriam, and everybody knew about how you have to be responsible with how you use your words, they were then sent at this moment in time in order to make sure, or hopefully, that they would be able to learn the lesson. Now, before we continue, some words of introduction. If I was the Kliyakar, or if the Kliyakar was giving the Shi'ur this morning, I am in absolutely no doubt that he would give approach number four before the paragraph we're about to learn together. Um, it just makes much more sense for our setting this morning when you are teaching a group of ladies to teach approach number four before the following paragraph. Now, we have a choice. We could change the order in order to not offend people, or we could learn things the way the Kliyakar wrote them, because that's the way he wrote them, but with a little bit of patience, knowing that approach number four is on the way. So I'll let you choose. If I don't hear anyone say anything in the next few seconds, I will assume that you're choosing to learn them the way the Kliyakar learned them. And therefore, what we're about to read is your fault, not my fault. So let's go ahead. Umita amze. Just, just to follow the process, approach number three was Moshe thought they were good people, but actually they were going to go wrong. Even though they were going to go wrong, Hashem timed it to give them the best possible chance straight after Miriam. And for that reason, Piret Kan Anashim. This is why men were chosen for the mission, men as opposed to women. Because what happened with the story of Miriam, Lefish and Emma, because it says, Vatidaber Miriam Aaron, Miriam and Aaron spoke. There's something grammatically incorrect there. Vatidaber means, and she, first, per, sorry, and she, second person singular, third person singular spoke. She spoke. But it's Miriam and Aaron, it's two people speaking. Why is it Vatidaber and she, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moshe? Vahaya Lolomai should have said Vayidabru and they spoke. Chi, because Vatidabe, the word Vatidabe, Chosera Miriam, only refers to Miriam. Vaod, Shalomatino, Onish Larod. Aaron appears to get away with this. Aaron and Miriam speak badly about Moshe. We all know about Miriam's punishment. And Aaron gets away with it. Scott Free, what's going on here? Ela Shegid Lachakat of the Torah is telling us. Shilashon Haramatsui Benashim, your term, Iba Anashim. Lashon hara is more commonly found amongst women than it is amongst men. As it says in the Gemara and Kiddushin, Ki asara kabin la'olam. There were 10 portions of speaking, speech, which came down to the world. Tishan aflu nashim, women took nine of them and they left one for the men. That's the Gemara and Kiddushin, page 49b. And therefore, ulafi, shestam nashim, pitpataniyot, dibraniyot. I could have put three dots here, but I didn't. Because the assumption is that women are pitpatiyot, dibaraniyot, they're very loquacious. They uh, like talking a lot. 
Alkain Tala Hadibu Bemiriam. When Miriam and Aaron spoke, obviously it was Miriam who was doing all the talking. She was the one who led this, and Aaron was secondary to her. That's where it says, send men. Straight after Miriam speaks Lashon Haram, predominantly it was Miriam, send men, because they wouldn't behave the way that women would. Below you, Miriam, they wouldn't be like Miriam, who spoke Lashon Haram. Send men, meaning men as opposed to women. I think he's made his point already. Now, what a shame that he wrote all of that before we reach approach number four, because so many people teach approach number four in the Kliyakar without mentioning the thing that we just read. I'm, I'm also guilty of that. I did that once in a drasha. I said what the Kliyakar is about to say without giving his introduction, because it sounds much better. So let's pretend we didn't hear what he just said and read approach number four. Davar acher, let's read another explanation. Lechach piret anashim. Why did Hashem send, tell Moshe to send men? Lefish amru chazal, because the sages told us, anashim hayusonim et aretz. Men hated the land of Israel. V'amru, and they said, nitna rosh v'nashova mitraima. It was the men who said, let's turn around, let's go back to Egypt. It was the men who lacked faith in the process and the journey to the land of Israel. It was all the men. The women love the land. Like the daughters of Tzlovchat who said, they pleaded, they, they, they said, we want a portion in the land. What does Hashem say to Moshe? In my divine opinion, and remember, I know what's going to happen in the future. You would have been better off sending female spies as opposed to male spies because women truly love the land. Because women won't speak negatively about the land. But you, Moshe, Moshe, if you really want and you insist, in your opinion, you think these men are okay. And you think the men really do appreciate this land. Send men. And that's why Hashem says to Moshe, send for yourself. In your opinion, Anashim, men. Hashem says, in my opinion, you would have been better off sending female spies as opposed to male spies. Now, just imagine if we would have learned approach number four before learning the other section, it would have come across much better and we all would have been in a full sense of security before moving on to read the other section. Either way, it is what it is. We have numerous explanations as to why Hashem tells Moshe, Shlach Lecha Anashim, and now, yes, Riva, please. Can't, can't they use their power of speech here? They would, be, they would have used their power of sweet speech to be more persuasive regarding the beauty of the land. So you can use the Tisha Kavin of Lashon for something very positive. Correct, correct. Speaking isn't necessarily negative. Speech can be used incredibly positively as well. Absolutely. And maybe women don't speak more Lashon Hara than men. I should keep quiet, but, but maybe what it's saying is that if women overall speak more, then proportionately there will be more Lashon Hara spoken because a certain percentage of all speech is going to be Lashon Hara, and therefore statistically there's more. Um, but I think we'll move on to the next section either way. Um, but if you want, the only thing you need to remember this morning is that the Kliaka said you should have sent female spies instead of male spies and everything would have been much better. Moving on to source number three. What happens in the very next Pasuk? It's very clear so far that Hashem is not overly comfortable with sending these spies. But then in source number three, Moshe sent them from Midbar Paran, Al Pi Hashem, according to the word of Hashem. Kulam and Hashem, they were all great guys. Rashev and Israel, Hema, the leaders of B'nai Israel. Now, how on earth? Can we say that this was Al-Pi Hashem? The truth is, it's not a question on the Pasuk. 
It's a question on all the Mepharshim who say that Hashem was reluctant and who read into this word, Lecha, Hashem's reluctance about sending this mission. The Torah says that Moshe sent the spies al pi Hashem, according to the mouth of Hashem. What does that mean? The Kliyaka says in source number four, Lo haya hashlichut al pi Hashem. No, the mission wasn't al pi Hashem. How can you say both? Somebody's written something in the chat. Um, Ashley, you're too Ashley. male. I'm not <laughs> going to read your comment. Source number four, Al-Pi Hashem. Lo Ashley Chut Al-Pi Hashem. The, com- the mission wasn't according to Hashem. Sherry Hamra, lo shlach lecha. He says, shlach lecha. So how could we reconcile this? Ela Ratzal Omar, what does it mean as follows? Shashli Chut Mimidbar Paran. The fact that the mission took place, that the point of departure was from Midbar Paran, Haya al pi Hashem, that was based on Hashem's instruction. Masa Harishan Machatzerot, that first journey from Chatzerot, that's where Miriam spoke Lashon Ara. Kelefi Divrei Hashem Yitbarach, according to Hashem, Loyam Askim Nishloach Kla. Hashem wasn't interested in this mission at all. Achlarov haftzaratam lo bahem, because we kept begging, he says, all right, if you insist on sending spies, send meraglim. But if you're going to send meraglim, what's the right time to send meraglim geographically? It's to do it when you're right next to the land. You have to take a few journeys to get from Midbar Paran geographically to the entrance of the land. He should have sent them from a different place. Close to Eretz Yisrael, you're telling me about a much closer place. If you're going to go on a spy mission, you start your mission close to the entry point of the land. Why did we start our spy mission in Midbar Paran? So the point is that starting at Midbar Paran was Al Pi Hashem. The timing and the location, the point of departure, was Hashem's decision. Why? Because we just left Chatzerot. As we explained, because we've just had the episode of Miriam. That that deed was very recent. Maybe from that context, they'll change their behavior. If you wait until you've reached a different point, closer to the land, they may have forgotten that which took place to Miriam. So where it says that they traveled Al-Pi Hashem, it doesn't mean that the mission was Al-Pi Hashem. But the fact that they left Midbar Paran as their point of departure, that was Al-Pi Hashem, Musav Al-Midbar Paran. Velal Etzam HaShlichot is not talking about the shlichut itself. If you think about it in, in our context, if, if you want to be convinced about this concept that Miriam would have made any difference to this mission, you know, nowadays, if somebody today was to say some, something about the life of a black person, they would be far more careful when choosing their words than they would be 30 days ago, and probably than they will be in 30 days' time. At the moment, because of this, international movement and discussion and debate and campaign about Black Lives Matter, obviously at the forefront of your mind, you're going to be careful about what you say and what you think. So if you imagine at the time, what happened to Miriam was the number one issue in the news at the time, then then it was clear that straight after Ma'aseh Miriam, that was the time to send people into the land, because that is a time where everybody at the forefront of their consciousness would be careful about how you use your words, because the need to be careful with your words was the number one issue in consciousness at the time. Another opinion, V'yesh Omrim, some people say, Shahayam Midbar Paran Davka, Hashem told us Davka to leave from Midbar Paran, why? Hashem worked out with his divine GPS that the whole mission would take 40 days from start to finish. Now, you see, the reason why we had an extra 40 years in the wilderness is one year per day that they went on this mission, 40 days was punished with 40 years, so Hashem wanted us to have a longer mission 
in order to give us extra years. Why? Not because Hashem wanted to give us a greater punishment. Rather, that's from the book of Job, that we would come in ripe old age to the grave. What Hashem wanted was that the people who sinned, who are now in their 20s, the younger ones, would at least reach the age of 60 before they passed away. Because had that generation had to die out, they all would have died out straight away and we would have gone straight into the land. But the decree of dying out in the wilderness was everybody's age 20 and up. And therefore Hashem wanted a longer mission because Hashem wanted these people's lives to be longer. And therefore, have we had a seven day mission, it would have, would have meant a seven year punishment. And the people who were 20 at the time would have passed away when they were 27. And the people who were 50 would have passed away when they were 57. Now, because the punishment was 40 years long, what it enabled was the people who were 20 to live until the age of 60, and the people who were 50 to live until the age of 90, Hashem wanted those individuals to live longer lives. And what we see, therefore, is that we're rebelling, we're sinning, sinning, we're changing the course of Jewish history, we're not learning about the fact that we have to be careful with our words, and Hashem is looking after us. And even in his punishment, Hashem wants us to still achieve things in this world. Moving on, source number five. Let's play, pay co careful attention to, we're still in Rishon of the Parsha. let's pay careful attention to what happens at the beginning. Parashat Shlachacha starts off more or less with a list of these great people. And in that context, we read in Pasuk Chet, Ephraim Hoshea bin Nun. The representative for the tribe of Ephraim was Hoshea, the son of Nun. Yosef, Menasheh. And three psukim later we read, for the tribe of Yosef, subdivision, Matem Menasheh, we have Gadi ben Susi, Gadi the son of Susi. Now, a uh, quick game of spot the difference. Both Ephraim and Menasheh were children of Yosef. Yet, it's Lemate Ephraim without any reference to Yosef, it's Hoshea bin Nun. And then when it comes to Gadi ben Susi, it's Lemate Yosef, Lemate Manashe Gadi ben Susi. So Yosef's only mentioned for Manashe, not for Ephraim. The Kliakal will discuss that soon. And the order here is just a, a different topic entirely. And um, why were the um, tribes listed in this order when it comes to the Maraglim. Let's assume for now that it's because that was their order of greatness. And then we finish off a few psukim later, These are the names of the individuals that having been through all of them. Moshe sent to scout to the land. And then Vaikra Moshe Hoshea binun Yehoshua. Moshe changed Hoshea's name to Yehoshua, as we know. And the classic question is, why did Hashem, Moshe change Yehoshua's name, Hoshea's name to Yehoshua? Why didn't he change Kalev's name as well? Kalev was the other good guy. And we can ask many other questions. Um, if, these were, if Moshe knew the other guys were bad guys, just don't send them. Or if he knew the other guys were bad guys, change all of their names. But another question you could ask is, we've got these two Ephraim and Manashe here. Why is Hoshea's name changed, but not Gadi ben Susi? Um, lots of questions, but the Kliakah will just focus on one or two of them. Let's look at the classic question. The bottom of page two. Yehoshua stands for Ka Yoshiacha Meatzat Meraglim. May Hashem save you from the conspiracy of the Meraglim. Yesh Litbonen, we need to contemplate. Lama Davka Shem Shel Ka. Why the name Ka, yud Hey Hashem's name was chosen? Why didn't he also daven for Kalev? That's a classic question, because you could also have Alef Lamed being Hashem's name, why the name yud Hey was added on. Maybe his name could have become Hosheel, or something like that. Anyway, approach number one. V'nir eh, lefish amar lahem, let's remember that the instruction was, alu negev, they were to enter the land from the south. The Hamaraglim Amru, what do they respond in their report? Amalek Yoshef Eretz HaNegev. Amalek is sitting in the land of the Negev. Pirish Rashi, Rashi explains. Lefishinich Vubo Yisrael, because we have been burnt by Amalek. 
If you want to terrify the Israelites, you just have to say the word Amalek, and it strikes fear into their hearts. So Amalek is dwelling, dwelling in the south, and we report back and we say Amalek is there. Now, when it comes to Amalek, Moshe thought to himself that if there's anyone who is not going to be scared of Amalek, who's it going to be? Shemistama be'etzazo lo ye Yehoshua. Yehoshua isn't going to be part of that etza. Ki adaraba, au contraire, hu hechlish et Amalek. Yehoshua is the one in battle who weakened Amalek, ve'et amolofi charef, and his people by the sword. And not only did Yehoshua defeat Amalek in battle, but in Shmot Perek Yud Zion, straight after that battle, um, not only is Yehoshua granted victory over Amalek, but he's given from Hashem an insurance policy and a guarantee that he's going to be victorious over Amalek for many generations. But as it says there, Kiyad al Kes Ka. There is a hand on the throne of Ka, of Hashem. Milchama Hashem b'Amalek midor dor. This is the promise to Yeshua that Hashem's battle against Amalek will be in every generation. So, the word Ka, Yud, and then He, Hashem's name is the word which is used in the promise to Yehoshua that he will be victorious, to Hoshea, that he will be victorious over Amalek. That Shavua, which we use the name Ka, Amalek, he will be sure to be victorious over Amalek. Al That's why Moshe added Ka, specifically that name, onto his name. To remind him of the oath which was with the name Ka. And therefore, he wouldn't be negatively influenced by the Meraglim, who made us all scared with Amalek. Um, just, just for everyone to know, when you write something in comments, you all see the comment coming up on the screen. I don't see it. What I see is that somebody has written something, so then I have to go in order to find it. But do feel free to unmute yourselves and to contribute that way. So... Why is his name changed to Yehoshua? Because he has a special connection with the Yud and the He. That is his insurance policy. That's his guarantee from Hashem that we will be victorious over Amalek. A second reason why Moshe was particularly concerned about Yehoshua. The Yeshomrim, some people say, Lefish Yehoshua Hayat because Yehoshua was his student. Now, we were all students of Moshe. We all learned the Torah from him on Har Sinai, so I suppose this means that Yoshua had a special place as a designated close student. Hikpid alav shaloyaktiach tav Moshe was very concerned about Yehoshua, that he shouldn't, let's say, go off the derech, that he shouldn't mess everything up. Yitlo barabo, because then it'll reflect very poorly on Moshe. Of all the Muraglim, Yoshua is the one who really needed to perform. Because if Yoshua gets things wrong, and Yoshua is so close to Moshe, you'll see, ah, you see the way Yoshua is behaving. Or you see what Yoshua is saying. This is Yoshua who's really close to Moshe. Therefore, Moshe needed Hoshea to really deliver here, because whatever Hoshea says would reflect on Moshe. And therefore, Hoshea in particular received an extra addition to his name. Approach number three, I think is the last one on this topic. The Yesh Omrim, some people explain, Yosef. This is actually quite nice, bringing us back to Yosef. Why did Yehoshua need an extra name to protect him? Because he comes from the tribe of Yosef. And let's remember what Yosef did back in the book of Breshit. Breshit was a long time ago. Shehefi dibat achiv. Yosef was the one who brought the evil speech about his brothers. Yosef is the one who gives bad reports. And now this is the representative of Yosef going into the land. Moshe was fearful that he shouldn't follow the way of his ancestor. And that's why Yosef isn't mentioned. However, over Begadi Ben Susi, his Kirlamata, sorry, not Lamata, Lamate. 
when it comes to Ephraim, Yosef isn't even mentioned here. It's this taboo subject, you know. Ooh, you're Hoshea bin Nun from Ephraim. Don't talk about Yosef. Don't mention Yosef. Don't bring us back to Lashon Hara. Yosef isn't even mentioned. It's just Matei Ephraim, Hoshea bin Nun. And also he changed his name to Yehoshua. When it came to Gadi ben Susi, it does mention Yosef. And that leads to the obvious question. Because it's all well and good saying that Hoshea bin Nun as the son of Menashe needed extra protection. And that's why we didn't talk about Yosef, because he comes all the way back to Yosef. But there's another guy here from the tribe of Yosef, and that's Gadi ben Susi. He also is a descendant of Yosef. Why aren't we concerned about him? He's also a descendant of Yosef. Maybe he thought. Ephraim is clearly the leader between the two sons, albeit the younger one. But if the representative of Ephraim doesn't change his job, meaning if he gets everything right, then everything will be okay. If Ephraim gets it right, you don't have to worry about Menashe. And also, it's already known from the time of Yaakov's blessings, Kisham Sam Lachok, nice play on words, but from that point of time, it was instilled as a rule, Lachdim et Ephraim Lachol Shdavash, Ephraim comes first. So maybe he was just more concerned about Ephraim, Ephraim's the more senior one, get Ephraim right, Menashe will fall into place. If you don't think that's a brilliant answer, maybe that's why he gives another answer. Or alternatively, Lefi Shenikra Aviv Menashe. Gadi ben Susi comes from the tribe of Menashe. What does Menashe mean? Al Shem. He was called Menashe based on Ki Nashani Elokim et Kol Beit Avi. That Hashem has made me forget the house of my father. Yosef calls his son Menashe because Menashe means forgetting. Now, as a general rule, if you want to forget something, Don't put up signs everywhere saying, forget this. You know, if you have reminders everywhere to forget something, of course you're not going to forget it. So why would calling his son Menashe help him forget his father's household? What Yosef is really saying here when he calls his son Menashe is acknowledging that his ability to emotionally detach himself from his father's household is what enabled him to succeed in Mitzrayim. And to a certain extent, forgetfulness is an amazing bracha. If you experience a traumatic event, the ability to forget that event, not that you forget it ever happened, but to be able to emotionally move on from that event is hugely powerful. And forgetfulness can be a very, very, very big bracha. People sometimes come to me and they apologize about things that they said or they've done. And I have absolutely no recollection of what they're talking about because Hashem's blessed me with an awful memory. And it's the most amazing bracha, because if you don't remember things, you can't be angry with people, and you don't bear grudges against people. In fact, now that they've come to apologize, I'm, I'll be upset, because now I find out what they did, and I've previously forgotten. But either way, the concept of forgetting is that it allows you to emotionally move on. And if this concept of forgetfulness has now been instilled into Menashe and his descendants, then you're not worried about the descendants of Menashe hanging on to old behaviors. Why? Because they're the forgetful ones. The Chashav Moshe, Moshe thought, Shemistama Kolzar, or the offspring of Menashe, Shechachu Kol Masavihem, or they're the Menashe ones, they're the forgetful ones. You don't have to worry about character traits being passed down from generation to generation in that line of the family because that line of the family leaves things behind. So Hashem changes Hoshea's name to Yehoshua for one of a number of reasons. And if ever you have one question with lots of answers, it sometimes just means there is no perfect answer, but perhaps we can take things from some of the answers or the combination of them all. What I'd like to do in the final section of this morning shi'ur is to jump to the end of the parsha and to jump to the section relating to tzitzit. Not necessarily that we all wear tzitzit in this group, but that we can still learn from the concept of tzitzit and the messages of tzitzit. And we certainly all read about tzitzit in our Kriyat Shema. Now, if you've printed out your source sheets, there's a mistake here, which I've corrected on the screens. But um, here it's Pasuk Lamed Zayin, Vayomer Hashem El Moshe. 
by mistake last night when I did this, I, I brought Pasuk Yud Zayin, which was Vayda Ber Hashem El Moshe. So if you have a printed sheet, um, that first Pasuk of source number seven is incorrect, and the one on the screens is the correct one, and I apologize for changing that, which is written in the Torah, which is a terrible thing to do. Hannah wants to know, how do you print them out? Please ask Naomi Bloch to uh, email you the source sheets each week, which I send to her on a Sunday evening. Source number seven. Hashem el Moshe Hashem said to Moshe as follows. Daber el b'nei Yisrael, speak to the Israelites. And say unto them, they should make tzitzit for themselves. Now, um, does anybody know what the word tzitzit literally means? From a grammatical point of view. Tzitz, to look. Exactly. Tzitz is to look. Lahatzit is to peek or to peer. And that's going to be relevant. So they should place tzitzit on the corners of their garments for generations. And on the corner of the tzitzit, you place a tzitzit thread. The whole focus of tzitzit is something most of us don't have nowadays, which is that tzitzit thread in the tzitzit. tzitzit. And it should be for them as tzitzit. Now, if we understand that tzitzit means to peek or to look, what it's really saying is, it should be for us as something to look at. And we'll look at it. You look at the tzitzit and you just remember all of Hashem's mitzvot. And you perform them. Look at this play on words. You will not be led astray. The beginning of the parasha is Moshe sends spies Latur to scout out the land. And in, in the tzitzit at the end of the parasha, it's Velotaturu. You won't be led astray after your heart and your eyes that you are want to be led astray after them. Now, these are very powerful tzitzit. All you have to do is put these strings on the corners of your garments. In fact, all you really need in those strings is this one techelet string. And what's the result? Uri Temotam, you look at it, and straight away you'll think, ah, Uzchatem et kol mitzvot Hashem, Masi Temotam, you will remember all the mitzvot of Hashem, and you'll do all of them. That's an amazing reminder. But how on earth does this blue thread remind you and enable you to keep all the mitzvot of Hashem? How does that work? Laman tiz keruva asitem et kol mitzvot and as a result, we're going to remember and perform all the mitzvot. Vitem kedoshim lelokechem, you're going to be holy to your God. Hashem is amazing. Hashem enabled us by giving us just one thread on the corner of our garments to keep all the mitzvot. But um, for that to work, we have to understand how it works. What does it mean? Source number eight. The asu lahem tzitzit. He says, Kol tochen ha He says, this entire parasha needs explanation. Correct. Ki ech yizkoret kol mitzvot Hashem al yedei shistakel b'chut shel techeilet. How is looking at a techeilet thread going to remind you of all the mitzvot of Hashem? V'nireh lefaresh zeh inyan b'shnei drachim. He says, we can explain this in one of two ways. We're going to focus more on the first way than the second way with our available time today. Haderech HaRishonu, and he's going to be building this on classical concepts, but taking it in a novel direction. The first approach is as follows. Al-Derech Sh'amru B'Sifrei, as it appears in the Midrash, Muviyo HaYalkut B'Prasha Ta'aziu, and it appears also in a different Midrash as well. Amar Lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu LeMoshe, Hashem says to Moshe, Emor Lehem Yisrael, say to the Israelites, Histaklu Bashamayim, look at the heavens, Shabarati Lisham Shachem that I created in order to serve you. Shema Shinu Midatam. In the skies, do, does anyone change the way they behave? Or Shema Allah Galgal Chamamim Namarav? Does the sun say, you know what, today I fancy coming up from the west? No. If you look at the heavens, there's absolute discipline when you look into the sky and you see that everything follows Hashem's instructions without veering. And not only that, the um, luminaries enjoy what they're doing. I, I personally don't know how we can tell that they're happy, but we do say, such as in Tefillah, there's a real joy in what the sun and the moon do. I haven't looked up as to um, why they are happy or how we can tell they're happy. But either way, 
when, and this isn't just about sit sit, any of us can look into the sky and to contemplate nature and to contemplate the world and the universe and just see how everything follows what Hashem tells it to do with joy. And also when you're looking out at the sea and it says, you're not going to fear Hashem. Look how I put the sand as a border to the sea. So the sea just comes constantly crashing at us. The sea constantly comes with its waves in order to destroy the earth, but the sand is there and the sea cannot cross it unless there are natural disasters, which is Hashem's choosing from time to time. Does the sea change the way it behaves? Not only does the sea not change its behavior, it takes pain in doing this, as opposed to the luminaries that enjoy their job. For the sea, this is a difficult job. But it still doesn't change this job. As it says, they roar and they don't change what they do. So if you put sit to the side for the moment, if any of us have a moment just to pause and breathe and look out at the sea, or to pause and just look up at the sky, looking out at the sea or looking up at the sky, says the Kliyakar, can based on the Midrash, can give us an understanding and say, look at how nature follows Hashem's rules exactly and doesn't change. When it comes to it says in the Gemara in Menachot, page 43b, is similar to the sea. The yam domela rakia, and the sea is like the sky. The rakia domela kisea kavod, and the sky is like Hashem's throne. So the classic explanation is how does looking at tchelet on your tzitzit remind you of Hashem and to keep all the mitzvot? You look at your tchelet, you think, ah, oh, that's blue, that reminds me of the sea. You think of the sea, and like, ah, oh, the sea, that's reflecting the sky. You think of the sky and you think, ah, oh, the sky, that reminds me of Hashem's Kisei Kavot. It's There are a few steps in this logical process, but, but how does that actually work? The Kliyakar explains. What really this saying is doing is explaining everything for us. Lomar to say, What's the point of looking at the Tchelet? To make you remember all the mitzvot of Hashem. We should not change from our purpose and our roles even one thread width. We shouldn't move even from one thread away from what we're supposed to be doing. Just as Tchelet reminds us of the sea. This looking at this thread reminds you of the sea, which is in a similar color. It means you've always got a sea view. Isn't that amazing? You've always got a room with a view of the sea. All you need is tchelet, and you've always got the sea opposite your eye. So a tchelet is a constant reminder of the sea. Therefore, you'll consider the behavior of the sea. Who doesn't even move one um, thread breadth away from its job. So the point is, you look at this blue thread and you realize that the sea does exactly what Hashem tells it to do without changing. And we also should not move one thread away from what Hashem tells us to do. And therefore we'll make a logical deduction when it comes to our own behavior. She is Bala Midrash, which was mentioned in the Midrash, Haomer, as it says, Histaklu Bayam, look at the sea. Ki histaklu hainu lashon tzitzit. The explanation of tzitzit is looking. That's what tzitzit means. Because it comes out from the expression, like in Shir Hashirim, where the beloved is peering through the lattices. So lehatzit is to look. So tzitzit is all about looking. So blue tzitzit is about looking at the blue. It's contemplating that which is blue, contemplating the sea. You should look and think about the sea. And you think to yourself, if the sea doesn't change, I shouldn't change. If I go against the, even one of Hashem's commandments, you're changing from that which Hashem has planned for you. Because Hashem says, Ad po tavo v'lo tosif. Hashem says, come this far and don't go further. Bazem mutar, 
the so this is what's allowed that's what's not allowed and that is what's reminded of us when we think about the sea which comes to a certain point and doesn't go further however looking at the sea is limited why you can't really only learn from the sea from the sea you can only learn to serve Hashem with fear that is not the ultimate perfection. Now, even if you're not convinced at the moment by this process of the tzitzit and the sea, what the Kriyakar is going to do for us now is to define ultimate perfection and achievement. So it's worthwhile knowing what that is. Ki me'ahava, if you serve Hashem from love, vo'vedet Hashem b'simcha gadol, and you serve Hashem with great joy, min lokim, then it's much, much more important than the fear of Hashem, because you reach much closer, and if you do it with joy, you derive benefit from your hard work in Torah. As our sages said to the Gemara and Brachot, if you serve Hashem with joy and love, the actual toil is enjoyable. If you're doing it from fear, you don't enjoy the act itself. You can have two people who are doing the same action. Let's say you've been given a job which is to, I don't know, to, to bake a cake for a grandchild's birthday. Or for one of you, it's baking a cake for a grandchild's birthday. And for the other one, it's baking a, a cake for someone who you are very disappointed with and you're making it because you're scared of offending them. So you do the same thing. It's the same work. You go shopping, you do the baking, you do everything. The cake looks identical, but for one of you, you, the process of making the cake is enjoyable. When you go shopping for the ingredients for the cake for your grandchild's birthday, that's an enjoyable process. And the actual baking process is enjoyable. Because when you do something with simcha and ahava, it's not only the end product which is enjoyable, the process is enjoyable, as opposed to when you do something out of fear, where perhaps the end product is the same good end product, but you've missed out on all the enjoyment along the way. So when we serve Hashem with love, all the effort is also enjoyable, as opposed to serving Hashem like the sea with fear, where that is lacking there. al therefore it says, V'yam domel It's not enough to think about the sea. The sea needs to remind us of the sky. You've always got a view of the sea. And then the next stage is to always think about the sky. Because the sea is similar to the sky. We should learn from the sky. The sky doesn't change either its rules. And it takes joy in that which it does. We should also serve Hashem with joy and love. And if one of us, the servant of Hashem, says, What difference does it make if I enjoy it? If I don't enjoy it, I'm doing what I have to do. That's why it says, The sky itself is similar to Hashem's throne. Through serving Hashem through love, we're going to come to cleaving to the Shekhinah. The point from which the soul was hewn. What does that mean? Love is the definition of our ultimate success. Ki aliyada yizke lidavek bekise kavod through love will be able to cleave to Hashem's throne. Valiyade sheyatzit v'istakel berakia. It's through looking at the sky. Yeniska lekise kavod aliyade dimyon atzvaim. Through the similar colors, you'll be remembered of Hashem's divine throne. So what's tzitzit all about? Tzitzit is all about love. The blue reminds you of the sea, and the sea reminds you of serving Hashem and keeping to the boundaries, not even moving one thread away from that which you're supposed to do. And the sea reminds you of the sky, and the sky reminds you about serving Hashem and not changing the rules and doing so with joy. And it's that love and joy which brings you close to Hashem, the glue which connects us to Hashem, that dveikut, the glue itself is love. And how is that referred to in tzitzit? 
Vezetam, that's why you have Shmona Chutin, eight threads on each corner, Chamishak Sharim, and five knots on each corner. Sachakol, because eight plus five is Shlosh Esrei 13, Kemispar Ahava, which is the gematria of Ahava love. On every single corner we have Ahava. What the Kliakar is saying is that Ahava itself is the ultimate purpose. That is our Tachlit. Haderech Hasheni, the final thing we'll look at is just one more way of explaining this. And he says as follows. Shekal ha-mitzvot nimshalu lebeged. All the mitzvot as a unit are compared to a garment. Shina Emar, as it says in Kohelet, Bechol Eitiyah Begdecha Levanim, your garments should always be, that means clean. Omnam, however, Yeshev del Nehem, there's a difference between a garment and mitzvot. Kistam beged arug davka min chutin harbe, a normal garment is woven from many individual threads. Kichut echad ein bokadeh kasot. Normally speaking, you can't make an entire garment out of one thread. It's many threads woven together in order to make a garment. Of our malbush hanishama, now we're being very Kabbalistic. The clothing of the soul, a noken, that's not how it works. Ela afilu bechut echad yesh sota. You can clothe your soul with a single thread. Kedadarash Rabbi Yochanan, as Rabbi Yochanan explained, Haim Shamar filu chok echad, if you keep just one of Hashem's statutes, nitzol me gehenem, you could be saved from gehenem. But to Amosh el davar, how does it work? Levi Shebrit Kruta, we have a covenant. Shem mitzvah, goreret mitzvah, one mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. Vim came, therefore. Miyad kisha asarak mitzvah achat. If all you do is just one mitzvah, how you call ha mitzvot bekocho la asot, all the mitzvot that you potentially could have done. Afal pishelo yatsu mina koach el apoal, even though they didn't leave their potential and reach fruition. It's as if you've actually done it. I've called this the opposite of unraveling because I don't know a word in English which is the opposite of unraveling. Um, and it's not raveling. Raveling <laughs> is one of the threads. So unraveling is you pull one thread and the whole thing falls apart. This is the complete opposite. All you need is one thread. All you need is one mitzvah, and you can build the entire clothing of the neshama. You can pull just one thread, and all the other mitzvot ravel. I made up that word in this context, around it. But that's the way it works. All you need is the one thread, the one mitzvah, and everything else comes together for the soul. This is the Kabbalistic secret of the techeilet red. To wrap Maybe, but it doesn't sound as good as the word that I made up. Hamas kiret kol mitzvot Hashem, which remembers all the mitzvot of Hashem. Ki al yadon ase beget shalem lan shama. That's how we can fully clothe the neshama, which is a very, a very um, Kabbalistic concept, which you're not explaining today. The enonik va'arum, and you don't get buried naked. That means in terms of your neshama having clothing. V'yesh od mitzvah achat hamas kiret kol mitzvot. Now, the one thread of techeilet, Remind you of all the mitzvot. There's only one other mitzvah mm-hmm. which can remind mm-hmm. you of all the mitzvot. Vahu and what's it? Vahavtal kamocha. That's the other thread. If you have the thread of vahavtal reyecha kamocha, it'll bring you together to all of the mitzvot. V'imkena nefor chut echad yachol avit adam lidei tachlit. Pay attention to the words here. One thread could bring you to your tachlit, to your ultimate purpose, and mm-hmm. tachlit is kaharat la. Hashan Techeilet. Techeilet is like Techeilet. Oh. oh, Hannah, thank you for not being on mute there. The sound effects were great. Oh, so, that was incredible. Techeilet is like Techeilet. Techeilet is bringing us to our ultimate purpose, which is love. This is one of the secrets of the Torah. Unfortunately, it's 10.30, so I cannot explain all these Kabbalistic things for you, but we'll finish off there. According to the Kli Akar, Two things to remember today. Number one, had Moshe sent women instead of men, everything would have been better. And number two, <laughs> our, techelet, our, techelet, our ultimate purpose, all you need is love. Have a great day. That sounds like a Beatles song. Are we going to Thank start? you. It does. It Thank does you very like much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi.
Thank you, Reba Novus. Have a great day. <laughs> Rabbi Novus? Yes, I get um, there were There were a set of shiurim on Kohelet. Yes. And in fact, if you look in chapter 5, there is a pasuk exactly on this notion mm. that with our chelek came the blessing of enjoyment. And if you look at uh, pasuk yudchet in chapter 5, it actually mm. spells it out. Oh, now, yeah? So let's just mm. do that now. It's a gift. Oh. Where are we? Kohelet. Okay. It's Kohelet chapter Kohelet five. chapter five. Pasuk Yudchet. Yudchet. Mm. There you go. Mm? That beautiful, oh. isn't that? This mm -hmm. very nice, and it's also in the in the um, it's in the uh, seum we make. Yes. About ano amelim um, yeah. um yeah. But there, there's also the negative, which is less positive. Yeah. Right. This, this pasuk, I think, fits in beautifully. Yeah, it's very nice. All right. Thank excellent. you very much. Have a good Rabbi day. this. Yes, Hannah. I just wanted to say that this parasha, up till today, always I had problems with it. But now that the Kliyaka has explained it in this way, and actually it came up in a, in a session I was on on Limud Oz, why, I think it was, um, why didn't the women go as spies? I never actually thought of that before. But not only this, but the sit was just beautiful. I didn't realize that. It's oh, made, Hannah, it's made so much right, sense. Hannah? And uh, I still don't understand Shrach but at least one of us does. All right. <laughs> <laughs> have a great day. Okay, have Bye. a good day. Thank you very much.